All right, we'll continue on here this afternoon. We're now going to ask our next speaker to come forward, Dave Sullivan, Chief Operating Officer of Global Agri Solutions. Solutions back in 2015, and he has questions. Now, he joined Global Ag Solutions back in 2015, and he has quite a few years of experience as an agrologist, ag retail manager, sales manager for Bayer Crop Science, and farm management consultant with Myers Norris Penny. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and a Master of Business Administration, both from the University of Saskatchewan. And he's also a licensed professional agrologist with Saskatchewan Institute of Agrologists and holds a Level 1 CAIB license in Saskatchewan. Loves long walks on the beach as well. Please welcome our next guest speaker. So I'll... I'll <laughs> I'll start with an apology. I am not Dave Sullivan. I am his proxy today. He's the tall, red-headed fellow back there, um, handsome as I'll be as well. So, um, no, so uh, my name is Damon Johnson from Global Ag Risk Solutions. Uh, so I work really closely with, uh, with Dave. Um, also want to introduce Jonathan Small from our team, our chief research officer, as well as Grant Kozier in the back, uh, chief executive officer from Global Ag Risk Solutions. Um, so, um, I'm a, I live in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. I'm a grain farmer from Margo, Saskatchewan. I just got done spraying Liberty last night, finally after in between some rains, and really happy to be here uh, with you folks in sweltering Moose Jaw to talk about, I've got a hard job today. I've got to talk about satellite imagery, insurance, and data, and make it sound exciting after lunch. <clears throat> so uh, bear with me for a second here. So the reason that we're here, so this is going back to, I think, Dave, Back to February of 2021, when Chad McPherson, who you guys know and love, and Dave Sullivan had a conversation about forage insurance, pasture, satellite, kind of that whole topic, um, and the reason that Dave was involved in that conversation and how Jonathan and I got involved, um, frankly, was because we have a high degree of aptitude and competence in building insurance products, mostly for crop, or crop producers uh, in, in Western Canada, but we've got data scientists and software guys and data nerds like myself and Jonathan on the team, and we were um, introduced to the task um, and, and took on the project uh, by way of the agri-risk initiative um, that AAFC provided from December of 2022 into March of 23. So in 123 really short days, I'm excited to tell you about some of the advancements we've made in the analytics and where we're going from here. So uh, with our group, um, as we always do, um, we know that satellite-based insurance products have existed for pastures and, and, and hay crops in Western Canada for years. Um, so, you know, one of our goals is not to replicate, repeat, try to replace it with something that's very similar. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. So we took this real broad view to, A, um, frame out what the product would look like or the coverages, um, well, and then also leverage a company called Airbus, who's an aerospace engineering company out of France, who, for the purpose of this product or, or this, uh, this type of structure, is they take satellite imagery and they feed it into us and we build indexes that you can build insurance off of. I think we've probably all heard that done before. I'm excited to tell you about why we did this differently. Um, so for this project, um, we knew that it was going to be satellite-based, but it had to be transparent um, as whether you're of crop producer, a livestock producer that's got forage crops, anything that's coming from a satellite miles in the sky and coming down to a computer and showing up in your phone, there's gotta be a lot of trust in, in that and, and we wanna build that through that. Um, it's gotta be accurate, it's gotta represent the risk that's at the farm um, and it's gotta be ex easily accessible and understandable to the user. So that was, our, that was our goal going into it and this all started really, honestly, it was December 15th of last year. Um, so like I said, we're, you know, we went to the point of extracting the data from a satellite, not super exciting. Um, we want to process it. We want to prepare it and do like initial analysis to say, what might a claim look like in Beachy or Cinnaboy or Maple Creek in this year based off of what the data said. Um, and then also, really, really importantly, and uh, we, we got to work um, with the great people at SCIC on this uh, part of the project is to compare what happened, what did the satellite say, what did a producer report in any given township, and did those two signals match? So that um, I think all of us sitting here today know that if production was low and you expected a claim payment, but the satellite said something different and you weren't supposed to, um, that's not going to create for a very good product. So we've been um, hugely immersed in that here over the course of about the last three months. 
Um, of course, what does it cost to provinces, to producers? What do claim outputs look like? So Jonathan uh, has spent an incredible amount of time on that. Um, we build computer programs that deliver this to the market through apps on your phone or on your computer, so there's that component. And at the end of the day, it has to land with the producer. They have to want to use it. There has to be a low amount of friction or no friction to acquire it uh, or enroll it and, and ensure their crop. So we, we follow this fundamental principle with every single one of our projects, and it was no different with this one. <clears throat> For us, uh, one of the hugest points was mitigating basis risk. And I'll try not to sound too much like a nerd on this. So what we really need to do is take, if you take a look at, um, a, a weather station solution that, you know, weather stations are fairly um, sparsely, um, you know, installed out in fields. And what that does is creates distance and space in between the thing that's measuring the outcome and the actual outcome in your field. Um, so in, in our world, we refer to that as basis risk, that, you know, where your farm is in the middle of that plot, you're 30 some miles away from the instrument that's measuring rainfall that is a direct input into the insurance product, right? So for us, a lot of what I'll talk about here, and I'll try to be quick, is um, moving to a, what we call a mesh grid structure, and that's just monitoring, modeling, and settling insurance contracts in very low um, spatial resolution. That looks like this. So in that spot there, we have five weather stations that are all 30, 40 miles away from each other. Um, so that inherently creates a basis risk. Where we put our mesh grid structure, we're only comparing each one of those red bordered polygons to itself over a long series. Um, and what that does is moves us from about five measurement points to 101 in that exact same area. So we're taking a big wide world and we're shrinking it down and shrinking it down and coming as close to the field as possible. Um, so in doing that, of course, um, a lot of insurances and different things are covered by, these are rural municipalities that, you know, they're, they're man-made lines. Townships also are six miles by six miles. There's about 3,400 of these in Saskatchewan. We can pick the ones that we want to work with. We'll talk about that in a second. But we start to come down from townships, and you can see the green underneath there. That's where we measure in. So we're essentially dissolving the township, Dominion Township structure and moving towards getting down into the township even closer to the field or multiple quarter sections that you as producers would have. So we're, we want to go from 50,000 to 30,000 to 5,000 to 1,000 feet. In our case, we're at 300 meters resolution is what we're working with. <clears throat> so, um, and what that does, of course, just for kind of representation, you see the township map. Of course, there's the Diefenbaker system, Long Lake, Old Wives Lake, Buffalo Pound, different water bodies there that kind of give you a sense of um, the layout, and you know, as townships inter inter intersect that, you know, what we did is dissolve that and replaced it with these meshes. And what that does, is, of course, is um, you know, mother nature does not make straight lines, right? So um, the biophysical nature of plants as they've historically grown and vegetation has produced in that exact same area over the last 22 years creates this signal for us to say, this is what things have like been historically, this is how you should measure it and structure it going forward. Um, so we're, you know, like I said, there's 186 weather stations out there that are being used for different products. Um, there's 3,400 townships, uh, and then there's about 12,800 of these mesh grid points. So we're getting kind of like, I explained it, we're going from standard definition to high definition television. And that's what it looks like when they uh, start to intersect. Um, so once we had that, <clears throat> excuse me, that structure in place, um, you know, we could start to kind of take a look at through a coarser filter, so you know, not super specific, to say when, when were the big claim years? And this graphic is showing hypothetical, hypothetical claims by years. Um, you know, the big years, 01, 02, 09, 2015, 2021, obviously, um, very recently. You know, what that does is, gives us a sense is, is the general signal following what actually happened? And in these cases, it did. Um, you know, so we'll take a look at 2015, for example. Um, as an insurance company and as a data analytics company, we are obsessed with weather. So what we'll also do is say, um, you know, what happened in 2015? And in this case, those graphics off to the side are saying May 2015 was incredibly dry. June 2015 was incredibly dry. Uh, that little um, that video screen on the bottom there is over top of that. But the rains finally showed up in July of 2015, but of course it was too late. Uh, to generate a crop and hence why we see 
the big claims, but we're constantly doing these sanity checks with, with that data. Um, where it got really fun for Jonathan and myself in this project is, uh, like I said, SCIC has been a great collaborative partner uh, with us, and they were able to provide some anonymized production data through their forage insurance program that said, um, you know, in over the course of 20 years, you know, this is where production was below average, i.e., and that would have generated a claim. And we compared that in a vacuum alongside to say, would, this, would the satellite have said the same thing as what the farmer um, reported to, to SAS Crop Insurance? So we, we did that for these 68 locations specifically to start. Um, and that was, uh, for guys like me, that's really exciting. So <clears throat> this is a bit of an eye chart. I understand that. But what we're essentially looking at here, so this is 2019 as to say, is the general signal of the satellite and the farmer produ or reported um, production moving in the same direction? So 2009, if you remember, was a high claims year. So we see the orange, the orange bar is going below average. That's the satellite signal. And the blue one is the forage insurance reported ones, right? So um, everybody's going like, why are the blue ones sticking up top above average? We'll get to that in a second. Um, Alternatively, 2010 was a much better year, and that signal all followed the same direction upwards, and not a lot of claims, um, given the fact that there was you know, lower temperatures, good precipitation, and good production. Um, so we went through that for 22 years, um, and then we kind of got to one that looked like this. This is 2018, and we were all sitting around a table in Moose Jaw here about probably a month ago, and kind of going like, what, what happened with these? Because we call it a program killer if the forage the farmer's reporting that I should have a claim and the satellite's saying, no, we don't see one, that's a non-starter for a program, right? So we're, we kind of took a look at the, the product and the dynamics and we said, there's gotta be something going on there. And, and, and it was Dave who said, um, in his brilliance, he said, I think what, keep in mind the satellite is monitoring from March 1st to about the middle of October and it's not cutting off its monitoring when Livestock producers would cut their hay and put it up and thereby there's no crop there to measure by a satellite anymore. Um, or the satellite sees it and it keeps sensing that it's green and, and, and we see this dispersion and, and differences. So um, we did a lot of work to say, you know, we need to make sure that we cut off the analysis from the satellite when the, far, the crop goes up and, and uh, is, is being reported. Um, or if it's a, you know, a, a native pasture that, of course, grows all season, we want to make sure that that remains to endure and we're measuring it and create this split season effect. So we, we did a bunch of that um, to move to the point where we moved from 68 townships to about 2,300, I think, Jonathan, um, and comparing those same outcomes. But we also said, while we're doing that, <clears throat> that, we need to look at the shorter time periods. So we were looking at it in 15 or 20 day time slices, time periods from the satellites, just so that we're not kind of over-representing you know, what was going on. Uh, we segmented it by brown, dark brown, and black soils, which of course is incredibly important. Um, and we also did it on different rolling averages, Olympic averages, uh, those types of situations. Um, so when, you know, when we got to the point of when we're doing those 68 townships, we kind of we started at about 68% accuracy comparing what the producer said to what the satellite did, and we kind of went, eh, it's not great. Uh, but we applied more filters to it, and we got to about 82%. Um, and then as the work that we've been conducting now, we're at about a 92% accuracy rate on the outcomes in comparing the yield production that the livestock producer would report relative to what the satellite would say. So we're, you know, frankly, when we were at 68%, we didn't know if we should continue. Um, but we really dug into the data, and we saw that there's a lot of opportunity to get more specific, more fine, and represent the risk that's happening on the farm by way of the satellite. Um, so that's really been the basis of uh, probably the last three weeks now that we've been con continuing to work on this um, in, uh, in a vacuum and, and of course with, within the, the industry stakeholder group. So all of that is really to get to the point of there's always the so what factor of like what does it cost, what's it going to cost the federal government, the provincial government, wh whomever it might be in terms of we get you need to get down to the money. At the end of the day, it's the money that matters. And um, you know, so when we look at you know, total program payments, for example, loss ratios, which is probably very uninteresting to you folks, but that's you know, the claim, claim uh, severity and intensity on any given year and what it would, that would directly correlate to program costs. Um, annual program costs for, for the provinces based on enrollments and acres and different things like that. Um, but of course, the big one is like, and this is, I'm just gonna disclaimer this one fairly heavily right now, Jonathan, to say, 
you know, these price outcomes, as they're displayed, you know, they're, the great thing about parametric products that we build is that they're fairly elastic. There's a lot of plasticity to change deductibles and make it fit to what you folks need in terms of production to make it fit within your operations. So when we're, you know, again, conceptual, you know, at $100 per acre coverage and in black soils, about $6.53 per acre. Um, don't write that down, don't publish that, but these are signed as some frameworks. So this is a short season hay crop that you would put up and you know, across all the different soil zones. You know, same thing for pasture, full season, um, you know, brown soils at a $30 per acre coverage is going to be, you know, we figure with all the math that comes into it, $2.59, let's say, approximately. So um, that really gets us to that point of, you know, a couple of things that we're, we're really, you know, internally pleased with. We're, we're, a, we're really proud of the work that's been completed. Um, SSGA has been an incredible partner. Um, this whole way with Chad and his group, um, as is the AAFC, all acronym you to death, AAFC, CCA, MASC, FASC, da, 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 so it goes on. But there's been a, a large contingent of industry groups involved, guys like Jeff Yorga in the room who have been like kind of a sounding board for us from like the producer angle to say, if we did this, would this be desirable? Um, so that's really a lot of the ongoing work in the next pieces is to say, what does this make sense? Because if you're farmer at Beachy and you've got, uh, you know, a crop, it's, this is when you would have been paid a claim under the structure of our program. Or if you're at Assiniboia or if you're at Shaunavan. So this is a sample of three. Jonathan and Dave Ablas have run, you know, a multitude of these at different locations because for the farmer perspective, the, the livestock producer, as with we do with our other products, you want to show the frequency and severity of you know, how many times this would have paid and to what extent it would have paid. It kind of gives you that peace of mind or that link to understanding historical production to what it might mean moving forward. So at Shaunavan in 20 or 2002, it would have been about $100 per acre payment. There's some years without payments, but that was one of the feedback pieces that we got when Jonathan was doing some interviews and focus group type of um, uh, concepts was not just design and insurance coverage that pays on the really bad years, the O2s, the 15s, the 2022s, pay smaller amounts more often. Uh, so that was an underlying fundamental within this. It's not just kind of the, you know, the, the federal emergency payment type of structure. Um, so it's paying relative to lost production. And that's where our focus uh, continues to, uh, to carry through. Um, and then, of course, I see people on their phones. We want to be able to set this up so that you can log into your phone. You can tap on your farm location. It's going to show you, um, you know, the historical uh, the time series of sever severity and occurrence of, of production. It'll give you a quote on your phone. You can bind your coverage. You can print off your application and move on. And, and uh, our goal is to get in and out as we have with our other products in about eight minutes, seven, eight minutes. Otherwise, there's just too much friction uh, involved and, and uh, you'll probably put it down and move on. So we, we, as we've worked on the data and the analytics and the insurance side, uh, we've also oops, you know, looked at scoping out what a user interface might look at if you want to log into your computer or go onto your phone application and pick your insurance coverage, pay for it and check out very easily on a very low friction type of concept. We want to be able to do that as we do with um, our other products. So that's all well scoped out now. It's a bit of an eye chart. I apologize for that. I was trying to squeeze it all in. But um, to this point, um, you know, there's times there we talk to Chad more than our own families just on this project. So, you know, a lot of great leadership and direction, introductions, networking, all those things. Um, so as we, you know, we're kind of informally but formally working on the next phase of this for two reasons, that we're so excited for it, this didn't die on the vine, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here um, as we work on it as kind of a product, project incubator, but with you know, our provincial cohorts, with the you know, um, SCIC, for example, um, is that there's a need opportunity here to bring something new, novel, that's accurate, that's enduring, and that people are gonna trust and wanna have on their farm every single year. So um, we're gonna continue to drive towards um, Accuracy, my data scientist who's based in Saskatoon, I was with him all morning. He's continuing to work on this. And we, we also see a really neat opportunity to 
use 2023 production season literally happening right now as like our laboratory petri dish to continue to work in a live simulation with real data, engage with you folks and bring back some feedback into it. Um, we continue to work on the, 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 the pricing guidelines, the definition, working with the federal government on you know those kind of subsidy components and, and risk sharing uh, components as well. Um, the IT systems, that's, that's the world that I live in. Uh, so work on that, um, but again, the massive one is, um, you know, as we continue to work with industry, which includes producers, um, the acronym is IGFIT, which I believe is Industry Government Forage Insurance Task Team. I think I got it, but um, that is, that's government, that's stakeholder groups like SSGA, SCA, um, and everybody's kind of pulling into this. So. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I've talked fast because that's relative to the amount of work that's completed in a very, very short amount of time. Um, but we've just had an absolute um, blast working on this, if that can even make sense, um, to get it to the point that where we're at. And um, our goal, Dave, Jonathan, uh, Grant in the room here as well too, is that we, we see a real unique opportunity to continue to drive this towards a solution. In our world, we'd love to see kind of a, uh, a piloted type of component for 2024 and be in a pre-commercialized actual product pilot in 2025. Of course, a lot of work that has to happen in a short amount of time with that, um, but we're very much driven towards that. And again, as we engage with all of the collaborative partners along the way as well too. So um, I think that's all. I don't know how long that took, but um, but happy to take some questions um, for, from anybody. Um, Grant, Dave, Jonathan as well too uh, can support. Do we have any questions here? You mentioned that uh, you're obsessed with weather, obviously, that makes sense. Um, there was a lot of information regarding the weather there. You had a lot of uh, detail there. Is that a, a partnership with Environment Canada that you get that, or do you have your own weather specialists and meteorologists that help analyze that to get that information? I love that question. So we... Um... Write this down, it's the only good question I asked today. <laughs> No, so I, um, it's funny because I've kind of become the internal weather nerd. I'm not a certified meteorologist. I just have this uh, quirky passion for weather, weather modeling and forecasting and, and doing those things. So, no, I, I mean, frankly, we, when we were building our canola heat blast product, for example, um, we'd done work with private weather stations and Environment Canada and different things like that. And given the kind of the first comment I made about basis risk is that if your field is in you know, just outside of Moose Jaw, but the weather station is north 18 miles, um, you're not measuring the same thing at the same location. So we, uh, frankly, abandoned that entire structure and just rebuilt our own gridded weather structure where on an hourly basis right now, I've got weather coming from a satellite into our computer and we're spitting that stuff out on a daily basis right now just so that we, as Grant puts it, so we have maps with no gaps in that every township, every pixel, every whatever that bordered signature is has its own weather analytics and it's not kind of a large regional model because um, I was spraying Liberty on Saturday. I got two inches of rain in the field that I was spraying in and a mile and a half south did not get a drop. The grid road was dry, right? So we've, you've got, especially with precipitation, you've got high amount of variability and very, very short amount of spaces. So to have a, you know, like I said, a weather station that's 36 miles away at my farm uh, is not reasonable. And that's another thing, too. It seems like weather patterns are so spotty now. You probably come across a lot of that yourself. Yep. Yeah, we, um, they are in it, like every, I like to joke is that other, every weather app is wrong. It's like, who's the least wrong? Uh, it's perfectly imperfect data. Um, but again, we've kind of gone to the point that we have access to software, so we just started to do it ourselves. And um, I don't know if I'm more accurate, but I'm certainly not less wrong. We have a question out there. Your name, please. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's wonderful to hear that you're advancing the, 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 the program to where you're at. C could you update me on, on how accurate the satellite imagery is in actually uh, predicting or assessing the, the, the ground biomass that, that is actually there? And does that vary, the accuracy, does that vary with the actual, you know, whether you've got two ton of biomass versus a quarter of a ton of biomass? So I'm just going to go back to the slide here. Where was it? So yeah, we, um, you know, on that, like I said, when we first started looking kind of large, large regionally, 
large time period, not a lot of like specificity. Like I said, we were only measuring about 68% accuracy, which nobody in here is going to buy that. Um, and when we even got, when we got to 80%, probably the last time I presented to you, that's probably the number I use, and we we're feeling much better about it, but our goal was always to get to that 90 range and up in the statistical analytics world is considered to be exceptional. And um, so we, that was our goal. So we're, you know, we're, we're not measuring biomass or yield specifically with a satellite. I need to be really clear about that. It's measuring, um, you know, the, the significance of the vegetation that's represented by how green the signal is, guys. There's red, green, and blue signal. Um, but as it's doing so um, and, and coming back to us, that's representing the historical average uh, versus, you know, the current growing conditions. So we're, the satellite can't say that your biomass or your, this, you would have this many kilograms of alfalfa per acre, hectare, whatever. Um, but when we're comparing the outcome of the claims with the satellite versus what you would have reported by way of kilograms per acre, we're getting very, you know, an, an above a 90% accuracy rate. So, Any other questions here this afternoon? No, one more, sure. Just for clarification, so you're not actually measuring kilograms or pounds per acre. Correct. Run that by me again. So it's, it's a sense, it, it, the satellite is sensing essentially the health of the crop. So it, it, it doesn't spit out a, we believe that at this current state on June the 28th that there is this many kilograms per acre. It's saying historically, this, when this looks nice and green and healthy, um, that's considered to be um, you know, a, a valuable above average or average crop. But when it's, you know, the satellite picks up, I'm just gonna go back a bit here. When the satellite picks up a, a, an area that's you know, red or, or, or yellow an area, that's saying that's below average. This f producer is probably gonna have less feed than he was anticipating on producing that's going to generate a claim. So it's not actually, we're not, we're not pegging to an actual production value using the, the, the satellite. So uh, thank you for that. But I'm, so if we have a, a really good growing season up until, let's say, the 15th of June, and then it turns hot and dry. So on 15th of June, I've got, looks like fantastic. It, it dries off, so by mid-July, I'm kind of all browned off. What does your reading on the 15th of June look like, and what does it look like on the 15th of July when it's all browned off? Yeah, so our, our goal would be to match up the reading that the satellite is producing relative to when you're going to cut it or put, and, and put it up, um, w w would be the goal. So like I said, when we, when we started, we were like March to October was the time period, and there was a lot of noise within the data. <clears throat> but as we kind of look at the southwest of Saskatchewan, we're going from March 1st to, you know, we want to cut off the measurement when the measurement should be cutting off and assess, you know, like you said, there's that, you kind of hit that peak on June 15th and then it starts to go down. We want to hit it on the last day or right around the last day to pick up that drop in production value because it got hot and it got dry. That's the value that we want to peg to within the insurance product. Thank you very much. Tyler, yeah. have you got... Yeah, just so the other... And this has got nothing to do with insurance, but what, how do you come up with the polygons, that, the irregular shaped polygons that your, your imprints are? Is that a soil based thing or a, um, everything else is in the square grids of sections or whatever yep. and this isn't? Yeah, so that, that is, this is given to us by Airbus, so it is their assessment of when they, it's a flight about every 10 days over the last 22 years to say historically this is where the production, I'm just going to zoom in one here, it's going to follow the, you know, the, 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 the biophysical vegetation, but it's saying the historical rainfall, the historical temperature, the soil type, elevation, topography, plant phenology, all those factors roll into that because those are essentially the inputs to create the output. So if it's, you know, historically lower rainfall and, lo and higher temperatures, it's probably going to say that's a lower production area, so it's going to establish an index value for each one of them. Um, you know, similar to how a brown soil zone versus a black soil zone type of concept would be is that the reason that black soils are, you know, more, more productive is because it's rained more and it had lower temperatures over the last 20,000 years. So it, that's the nature of the outcome. Tyler, did you have one? 
Lynn took my exact question. Oh, okay. There, so it's all good. Well, we'll leave it there. We do have to move on to our next presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Dave would have done a good job, but you did a better job. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Global Agrisk Solutions and Gunnar Diebold has got a nice little plaque here for you.